Hello and welcome to the Virtual Thoughts episode number eight. And I'm here with John Gentry, the VP of Marketing and Alliances at Virtual Instruments. Welcome, John. Thank you, Ed. Now, one of the things, Virtual Instruments has an interesting suite of tools that you that are coming out and you already have. I mean, it's a great set. And it begs the question, though, is that as we move more towards the cloud, one of the questions I'm going to have at VMworld for almost everybody, and one of the questions I always talk to about everybody, with everybody, is how do you get homogeneity or homogeneous monitoring environment or a homogeneous environment just for managing? Oh, I got Amazon over here, I got, you know, vCenter over here, and I got my OpenStack over here, and I have Azure, and I have SAS, all these 15, 30, 2,000 SaaS platforms. I need to know how they're performing. I need to know whether or not I have the right workloads everywhere. I even need cost measurements back to say, how much is that really going to cost me? Yeah, and there certainly is some um, uh, misconception around the true cost of cloud uh, and certainly hybrid cloud. But I think you, you bring up a good point. Uh, and one that Virtual Wisdom uh, as a platform and Virtual Instruments as a company is trying to, to solve for, and that is how do I get a, a common or consistent view of all of those really hybrid environments, right? As I, as I look to migrate workload from inside the data center to outside the data center, everything is essentially hybrid. You know, how can I have a, a common viewpoint or common data set from which to make those key decisions? Uh, which workload should live where? How do I support that workload with the right, not just capacity, but the right performance-based capacity. Uh, and I think these are questions we've been solving for the enterprise in the data center for quite some time, to your point, um, but everyone's moving to a hybrid world, so really looking to expand that support going forward. Well, and this is now more than four resources. Before, we just had to deal with networking and, and storage and you know compute and memory, but now we have GPUs thrown into the mix. You know. What's net, what is the next greatest resource that's going to be out there that everybody's going to have to share? I mean, another common one in the cloud is security modules, hardware security modules. I have to share them amongst multiple things. So what I want to know, I mean, if I was going to be moving a workload into a cloud, I'd like to know how much that's all going to cost me. I also like to know how I can measure it. And if I find that that's not the right place, what do I do from there? Yeah, I think the, the second point you bring up <clears throat> is really the focus area for us at this stage, which is how do I know what type of service level I'm going to be able to expect or, or even get a commitment to when I move to uh, a cloud-based environment, right? Uh, I think at best there are availability-based SLAs today, but even those lack any real teeth when you look at some of the big, what I call kind of commodity cloud providers like the Amazons and Azures. Um, and customers that are used to a certain performance expectation with the traditional approach to uh, the compute stack uh, are looking to the cloud saying, well, how can I ensure performance and availability and not just availability, you know, four nines, five nines, but an actual performance level that's suitable to my end user requirement. Um, that's really where Virtual Instruments tries to step in and say, at least we can give you a common viewpoint or common metrics across the environments to say how is the workload performing, how is the infrastructure performing that's supporting that supporting that workload. And then that begs the question, when do I pull it back or push more out there? And and then from there you can start to look at cost components and, and other elements. Um, today it's very much focused on that, that performance based approach. And, and frankly that's where we've seen really more of the what I would call enterprise class cloud providers uh, looking to differentiate um, from the, the more common competitors with a performance-based SLA. Uh, I know that if I'm in the business of making money, I don't really want to participate in the race to zero, right? And, and if I'm an enterprise, I'm less concerned with um, the incremental cost and more concerned with the total cost, which also includes an element of end-user satisfaction, end-user adoption, retention, all those things that come right alongside uh, having a high performance bar. Well, not only that, it's not really about just the enterprise. I mean, SMEs, I mean, small, medium enterprises, even SMBs will benefit because almost all of them are in the cloud somewhere. And if I have a little bit in Azure and a little bit in Amazon, you know, I made a choice to do that. I need some way to look at those as in, as in one way. I don't want to have to say, okay, I want to look at Azure's metrics. I want to look at Amazon's metrics and I have to figure it out. 
for a lot of the small medium enterprises and the small medium businesses and even some large and extremely large enterprises when they're using 15 20 or 30 different clouds that's just too difficult they don't have the time to write their own tools so how do i get this I mean, is there a way to do a cross cloud view of performance so I know, hey, this is what it is in Amazon for this workload. You know what? I have that same workload in these 17 other clouds. Let me see what it looks like there. So today there really isn't. Um, at Virtual Instruments, we're taking a very purposeful approach. Um, we believe, for, for better or worse, that we've learned uh, an amazing amount from our existing enterprise install base around what metrics are important, and even uh, more importantly, how you correlate and analyze those metrics to get to really meaningful answers. And, and so, as you well know, in the cloud, you're, you're really relegated to the data that they make available. And it's actually um, not very good data half the time. Uh, in many cases. However, if you can at least pull that data into a platform that has some context or some history around what are the important or meaningful correlations across, say, all the layers of a stack, be it converged or hyper-converged around compute, memory, storage, or I.O., you can at least get to some more meaningful insights, um, really trying to drive beyond a simple availability conversation to an understanding of performance. Uh, and then for us, it's about having common metrics between the public cloud where the data may not be as great, but it can still be put in context and correlated with the data that's much more granular that you have from, say, your own data center environment. Uh, and you can start to get to, to meaningful decisions around where should workload be placed depending on how important that workload is and how detailed you want the measurement of, say, performance uh, to be. But you can only get that feel as long as you can read the data from the various clouds and then correlate it. If you're not doing that, you know, you still have a, a heterogeneous environment with no homogeneous management. Very true. And in the same way that, you know, the historic approach to what I would call device-based management in the data center. So I look at the metrics from my storage array and then I look at the metrics say my switching infrastructure, and, and I had to do basically spreadsheet correlation across three different tools. In the same way that was insufficient for the enterprise, doing that same thing all over again for the cloud is a very big challenge. And so while we kind of brought a consistent non-device specific view to all those layers in an enterprise environment, we're looking to bring a similar approach to the hybrid cloud world. Uh, although admittedly not there yet, uh, certainly something very much in our sights. Well, and you got to think about it, it has to be that way because doing it by spreadsheet is just not going to be good enough. We all know that. And being able to take data from one cloud and put it into a tool and look at it together and actually eventually get a, a picture of, if I'm running the same workload in all three clouds, which one performs better, you know, I may move more of my workloads there. That's a, that's a question that's commonly asked is like, where is my workload going to produce the best results? use the least resources, and eventually cost me less. And, and there's the, the two keys there. One, uh, we are starting to see a trend toward what I would call enterprise class cloud providers trying to differentiate by giving better data, having more of a performance bent to what they provide in terms of the management interface. Um, at the same time, ultimately that's got to drive an economic proposition, right? And, and I think what we've seen in early adoption is the lack of data has led to the same over-provisioning of cloud that you had in the legacy data center where, well, I hope it's working. Let's just go and, and throw as much. I, I've heard stats as much as, you know, 40, 50 percent sort of over-provisioned in the cloud. There's a, a perception of a cost savings, but if you're running with a bunch of excess overhead, where is that cost savings? Well, and that's the thing that bothers me a lot. It's like, oh, we just burst it out to the cloud, and then they keep it there for four years. And, you know, I may need it for, I may need it a couple extra hundred workloads or whatever combinations of apps running or another hundred instances of the same app. I put it out in Amazon, and then it stays running for the next four months when I only needed it for two weeks. Yes, well, th that describes something that I found common um, for better or worse, in, in IT, 
we are great at adopting the next best thing, the next new shiny object. We're not as good at decommissioning the old. Uh, and so you've got these environments that are, are dealing with, you know, 10 years of legacy in addition to the latest and greatest. Uh, I know in the enterprise environment, you've got you know, people dropping in net new flash arrays to try and achieve a performance gain, but dropping them into an aged environment where really you're just putting a Ferrari on a dirt road. Um, in the same way that I'm adopting a new cloud or bursting to a new cloud, but do I really have the processes in place to do so with some governance? Right? And I think you know, visibility is the first part of a governance model. Um, that's where we're certainly trying to start, which is give the good data to make better decisions. Uh, affecting the people, process, and technology uh, is always kind of the trifecta for IT, right? Well, I think the people and process will have to leave elsewhere because that's an ongoing struggle for every IT department. And if people are looking at what's happening with IT in the future, it may not even be a department. It may be just a group of people that they manage the clouds. The, the cloud broker. I think uh, it, we're coming up on VMworld, and I think last year at VMworld, during the keynote, he said quite clearly, if, if we can't offer a better level of service as an internal IT organization, there won't be an internal IT organization going forward, right? And I think that's just what you just said, right? It's, we'll have cloud brokers, um, but those ultimately will need to be service level managers. Uh, and, and so I do think still what underpins really that migration and, and good decision making around where workloads should live is the, the visibility to, to really be judicious or, or make informed decisions about that. And, and, and we're clearly not there yet, um, but hopefully going in that direction. But you, you're adding some new hypervisors, I've heard, and you actually starting down the path of a homogeneous management for heterogeneous environments. And that's actually, I think, if we can get to that point, and just for gathering and looking at data and correlating for SLAs, I think we're actually on the right track. And that's certainly our vision. We, you're right. We just introduced uh, expanded support beyond uh, VMware vSphere to include uh, IBM's Power VM for AIX environments, still very prevalent in mission critical workload, uh, as well as support for Microsoft's Hyper V, which we see making huge gains uh, in both the enterprise and SME markets. Uh, I think our vision is really, you know, any hypervisor or any interconnect, uh, we, we jokingly say from AIX to AWS, um, which uh, isn't a, a reality today, but is very much in our sights. So, you know, we're an enterprise company, so we've started uh, there where mission critical workload lives today, but uh, we're even moving deployment of the virtual wisdom solution uh, to have a, a cloud-based deployment option where we've uh, experienced firsthand the need for better management capabilities in the cloud. Uh, and that's accelerated our development efforts around integration, uh, likely with AWS first, um, just because they have a, a little bit richer data available today. But again, it's pulling that data into a platform that can provide the correlation and analysis to give just what you said, a, a homogenous or common view across a very heterogeneous and often hybrid uh, environment, and I look. For, I would look for such a tool, and such a management pl visibility plane to actually allow me to plug other things into it to do the exact same thing. It'd be really cool in the future, for example, to say, okay, I got virtual wisdom for this, and its correlation engine displays X, Y, and Z, and then I can mash up the three different main charts I want for costs from yet another package. Let's say for across all of my clouds. You know, joining those together into one view becomes a very strong message and a, a strong way of looking at everything because, to be honest, if you're in IT today and you're not worried about costs, you may not be doing your job. Absolutely. Um, it's and, not just SLA. It's the actual cost to gain that SLA becomes very, very important for the future. And th there is a, an element in legacy uh, around some well, that's not the way I've done it, or it's not the way I've always done it, and, and that's out the window now, right? Everything is changing, and changing at a more rapid pace than I think we've ever seen uh, in, in the IT sector. Um, cost ultimately is the driver for the business. How do I support a business application or a business process 
with the, the right balance of performance and cost uh, and, and the right balance of risk, quite frankly, at the same time. Um, you know, I, I think, and we're starting to see it, it's interesting you mention uh, additional data sources and, and even the ability to push data out. Uh, without getting too far ahead of myself, we do have a project underway that is very much kind of a, uh, for lack of a better term, I'll call it open API. Uh, so that you could pull any metric in um, and correlate it with the other uh, key metrics around the infrastructure and infrastructure performance. So imagine pulling in uh, business transaction volumes from an application layer and correlating those to back-end workload from an infrastructure perspective. Um, or you think of it in the other direction and you've got a lot of customers that are growing these huge, what they call data lakes. Yes. Right? And they want to drive their own analytics against that. So then they ask us, well, how do we pull some of the key outcomes, not necessarily the data alone, but maybe it's analyzed data that delivers an outcome into that data lake to correlate with their own tools. Uh, and so I think what we'll find, and certainly something that we've been talking about here at Virtual Instruments for a while, is the, the nature or, or the, the, the characteristic of a, a more open ecosystem uh, across all of the various providers so that at the end of the day the customer can get to what they need which is which is the answer uh, am I getting the highest performance at the appropriate cost with the appropriate risk and and how do I evaluate the myriad of providers that will ultimately be available from Azure and AWS to platform as a service to application as a service to what still lives in my existing or, or long-term long-standing data center well, not only that. Once I ask the, I mean, what I find with with lots of correlation engines and so forth is that once they start asking the first question and getting a good, valid answer, they'll ask even more interesting questions after that. They just got to get over that first one. <laughs> yes, and and um, we've taken great care to not just be what I would call mathematical correlation, right? Which, which while interesting, isn't always as insightful. Um, as experience-based correlation, which is how do we leverage our experience with 400 plus enterprise customers across a myriad of heterogeneous providers to, to get to answers faster, to say, here's the data, but here's the data in context, and here's the correlation, but here's the correlation that is 90% of our experience, causal, right? And, and you know, uh, I'll use a simple example. Correlating the megabytes per second with the percent utilization is interesting mathematically but somewhat irrelevant from because it's essentially the same metric but correlating that to then a performance or latency issue is now meaningful because now I can see what the root cause of that performance issue is so for us it's bringing that knowledge store and, and the associated correlation and analytics engine and opening up the data ingest to whatever the customer needs to pull in and make sense of Absolutely. And now it gives me a new way to look at the world. The way I did it before doesn't count anymore because now I have a new way to look at maybe the same old data, but I'm getting new answers. Absolutely. And, and key to that, uh, at least for us, is, is you can't start out trying to be all things to all people. I think we've all heard the promise of single pane of glass since yes. the early management frameworks, right? And, and they've all failed miserably. So we're starting with a very specific focus around performance management and workload management, starting with our core, which is the enterprise, um, and, and really that enterprise legacy data center infrastructure, and now adding to that multiple hypervisors so that we get to the heterogeneous nature of those enterprises. You can imagine things like OpenStack very much in our sites from a near-term futures perspective. Um, multiple interconnects, you know, we've been historically a fiber channel centric company. We've added NAS and FCOE getting us on the Ethernet. You can see obviously iSCSI out there in our sites to support things like OpenStack and Hyperconverged. Ultimately that all underpins then the traditional scale out cloud architectures. And while we'll have to live with the data they make available early, uh, hopefully we can encourage them to make better data available over time. And that's, that's all we could hope for from most cloud providers. True. Although the enterprise class clouds, uh, the ones delivering like SAP as a service, they're already there. They want to differentiate based on service level and, and performance-based service level. So absolutely, a, a new uptick in interest and demand from, from that class of provider. Well, 
Thank you very much, John. This has been the, the um, eighth episode of Virtual Thoughts. Um, thank you for being on. My pleasure, Ed. Great conversation as always.